everybody, and welcome back to the Chaluminati Podcast, episode 167, I believe. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the Smothers Brothers. Yo, hey, from LA. Man, I love man, the man, Smothers man, Brothers. Man, man. <laughs> All right, Alex I feel and that. Jesse. What's up? I vibe with that. You vibe yep. with the Smothers Brothers? Love them. Yeah. They got, I just see this picture of them. They're like wearing red suits, very bright. One's holding like a classic bass. Very- you Tom? Are you Tom or you Dick? Oh, 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 come on. Come on, I'm you definitely the Tom of this situation. You, Tom? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Smothers Brothers. Here, here's my question. Have you never seen the actual Smothers Brothers, Mathis? Is that before I never heard time? of them until I saw them on that list. Dude, the I've Smothers never heard Brothers. Of them. Yeah, I've never heard of the Smothers Brothers. I said I picked them because the, the name was funny. <laughs> that was wholesome family entertainment back I, in the day. I don't doubt it. What, they looked, The picture looked like the 60s. Is that about right? This is like... Yeah, yeah it's the 60s. Eh, well, all right. Sure, sure, sure. But for me, it would have been late 80s. Yeah, gotcha. they were everywhere. They were always doing things. Uh, yeah, I would have been like, I don't know. Seven, eight, nine, ten. When they were still around, and then I, I don't know what happened to them. Like all things, I guess I dropped off or they dropped off. Either Let's way. find out. Smothers they had the, brothers. They had the uh, TV show, and yeah. then there was like another version of it. I think later when they were like a little older that I've seen clips from. They're still they're still going. I have the pop culture knowledge of uh, like a eighty year old man. Like I've I'm I'm locked in. Don't worry about it. If it happened in Los Angeles in in any in the last 100 years, I know about it. They got fired 50 years ago? Fired? Yeah, they celebrated their 50-year mark of, of being fired by CBS uh, in 2019 for whatever reason. I don't understand what that's about. I don't know. I can believe that. So you weird. see that long Twitter post about the the three of us being the mind, body, and soul yeah. of uh, of the podcast? I did see that, and it's, you know what? Eh, it's accurate. I mean, that's pretty accurate. I think Jex, Jesse and I are both the body of the podcast in a way. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, you know the, what the real body of this podcast is, though, Alex? Gross. Gross. Yeah, I do. And it's the fantastic, fantastic website, which we have. It is called, don't let me get this wrong. It's patreon.com slash Illuminati pod. It's a website. It's a we- That's it. It's a website. And that's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. Maybe you should check it out. See what's there. You should. Surprises are waiting for you. You know what this is? This is a mystery podcast. So you know what? Solve your first mystery by heading over to patreon.com slash pod and seeing what you can do to help us do our thing more. That's a that's the perfect pitch. Perfect. I, it's I a couldn't... website that is on the web. The web. Mm, it's true. Both of those statements are true. Um, what else is true is that by the time this episode goes out, we can talk about it. Live show, everybody. Halloween live hey, yes. show this year, October 25th in L.A. at the Terragram Ballroom. Chaluminatipod.com, as always, to go get your tickets while you still can. we got a handful of like VIP tickets like we always do, plus general admission. We're going to be doing uh, this got all ages uh, place. So, if, I mean, I wouldn't bring your like six or seven year old to our show, <laughs> but if you are a bad parent, you're welcome to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Here's I'm, my here's my plan for this year. Can uh-huh, I okay, we got it. We got an Alex plan already. I'm trying to convince as many people who come to the show as possible to wear a pair of glow in the dark vampire fangs on their teeth. Okay. No, don't do you know that. What I'm talking What's about gonna, no. One person's gonna do it, and then they're gonna feel awkward because they're the only person who did it, and I frankly well, don't want. There's that gonna them. be at least one other person who's gonna do it. Why? We're gonna call it. <laughs> It's going to be called Alex's Big Smile, and we're going to see who's going to do it, and everybody's going to wear glow-in-the-dark Alex's. plastic vampire teeth, and it's going to happen one minute after the beginning of the show. Be there, be square. You will Alex's have forgot. I'm going to forget. You're going to forget this. You think I'm going to forget? I think you're going to forget this. If you, uh, how if can you I poss- when the show starts, go, it's time for Alex's Big Smile, <laughs> I will lose my mind. I will have forgotten. I will be very confused, I think. Don't, this is the first time I've mentioned a hashtag since 2017. Hashtag. Oh, my God. The big ha, hashtag Alex's big smile. Alex's Don't forget it. At Illuminati Pod. Don't forget it. Smile. Glow in the dark vampire fangs. October twenty fifth, Tuesday. Mathis has to go to a wedding. That's why it's not on the weekend. Yes, it's not on the Friday because I got to go be at a in a wedding. I'm part of the wedding party. I can't even just like skip it. I got it. And go. you know why that is? That's because the Illuminati believes that love conquers all. Okay, right. so think about that. We're lovers, folks. That's why this is happening on a Tuesday. And if you're lovers, you can come and you can join us on a Tuesday and it's no big deal. And you're going to do it in a pair of glow in the dark plastic vampire fangs. Hashtag Alex's big smile. Find me on Twitter. 
<laughs> at Fossianier. Let me know how big your smile is going to be on October 25th. ChiluminatiPod.com. You can buy tickets. ChiluminatiPod.com. You can buy tickets to the live show where you're going to do Alex's big smile. ChiluminatiPod.com. <laughs> Don't forget about Alex's big smile. Like I might. Yeah, like you might. And if you like the art and poster that's on that website, don't you worry. If you're at the live show, you'll be able to get one for yourself. Maybe one of my Dude, favorite live show posters we've ever ever had for so a show. so sick. I wish that there was some like, I wish that we put out like a CD or something so this could be the <laughs> fucking cover. It's so sick. It's just a Shout CD. out to Sean. Uh, yeah, Sean always kills it. He, he crushed it again. And uh, we'll see more of his art uh, for the live show, I'm sure. Um, so before we get going, there's one thing I came across that I just wanted to bring up. That has really nothing to do with the topic at hand. However, it was a historical fact, and I wanted to know if Jesse had ever heard about it because it fascinated me. Have you ever? It's very, very brief. Have you ever heard of the uh, the Erfurt Latrine disaster? Erfurt Latrine disaster? No, I've never. Excellent. Heard of it. So I came across this, and it was some. I think I came across on Twitter. This is out of Wikipedia. In July of 1184, <laughs> Henry the Sixth, King of Germany, later later the Holy Roman Empire held court at Hoftag in Petersburg, Citadel, and Erfurt. On the morning of the 26th of July, the combined weight of the assembled nobles caused the wooden story second floor of the building to collapse, and most of them fell into the latrine cesspit below the ground floor, where 60 of them drowned in liquid excrement. Amazing. Holy fucking this shit. This event is called Erfurter Latrine de Citrus, which is just the latrine disaster in is it, yeah, and Is it confirmed real? Is this like a thing that we, or is this like one of those stories like Catherine the Great died banging a says, horse, which is not true. Several German sources. Let me double check she it. She had a green uh, stone. <laughs> oh, God. And there it is. That's it. Latrine disaster wiki. The true story. Yeah. Uh, This looks real. Yeah, holy fucking shit yep. is what I'm going to call that. God, man, 60 noblemen drowning in shit. <laughs> like, that's just the worst way to go because just too many, too many men sitting up on the second floor. That's hilarious. So there you go. A little uh, historical nugget to open up this episode of nothing but true facts. OK, gentlemen, are you ready? Hmm. Huh. Are you ready? Because today I'm, I've never been more ready. I've been waiting for this. I'm so excited. For probably today. about as long as the audience. This so, is I'm so hyped for this. I am so pumped that you're pumped because I'm pumped. So obviously last episode was filled with a lot of fantastical stories. Even I myself do not subscribe to that 12 alien species theory. However, I just felt it important for the next what I'm going to say are two episodes because I've decided exactly Yo. how I want to break this up. And I think it'll be really fun. So go back and listen to it. It's basically a refresher from, I think, what is officially episode three of our podcast. Kind of go over the same stuff a little bit deeper and just kind of give our more updated opinions on it. Um, it uh, just goes over many, many different alien species. Today, however, we are moving to the actual event, the Coronado group abduction that happened in March of 1994 at the Coronado Hotel during a UFO conference who just so happened to be there, not for the UFO conference, but invited by the Scandinavian uh, ambassador, President Bill Clinton, and all of his Secret Service were in the same area during the same time during the abduction event. T time out. Yeah. Time out. Yeah. I don't know if you mentioned this last time. I did bring up I Bill Clinton it. a little bit, but I didn't really. No, uh, well, Bill Clinton's not even like, you're telling me this is a UFO conference? And they yes. got abducted at the UFO conference? Yes. I didn't know yes. that's what this was last yes, time. Correct. I thought it was just a hotel incident with Bill Clinton. You're telling me <laughs> that this was a... It's exactly, it's exactly the same thing as auditioning as a voice actor at Anime Expo. There is no difference. It's the same Amazing. thing. Amazing. It's the same thing as playing God of War early at E3. Yeah, uh, exact same thing. Exactly it. Uh, this conference was mostly put together for people who had had histories and kind of like run-ins with abductions and whatnot and it was there was a lot of like telling your story to an understanding audience kind of thing if that makes sense like not like making money and selling books but more exchanging and telling their abduction uh, right right, right, right. Like the mandela right. effect subreddit yeah I got you. yeah sure, right. sure 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 yeah, yeah. Um, no reason to lie so here at all yeah. the yeah, reason yeah. i also one of the other reasons i also want to break this down into a full three episodes is because surprisingly for this particular event there's very little out there about it. There are a couple of books and we'll be using, uh, the main book we'll be using for this episode is the Cor Coronado, the President, the Secret Service and Alien Abductions. 
by Yvonne R. Smith, which is the, we talked a little bit about her and who she is in last episode, go listen to it. Um, this is honestly the best book on this event that I found. It, there's a lot of solid like paperwork evidence of doctor appointments and inspections of the people who did claim to be abducted. And it's well worth reading. Like I will never be able to go through everything in here. And she does a phenomenal job of laying everything out and a got going going through the event. But before we dive into it fully, let's actually, for Jesse's sake and everyone's sake, lay out exactly what this conference was, when it was happening, and what was happening at the time. If you haven't heard already, it's smooth sack summer. When you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you've escaped from your pubes to your bum. I, you know, that line is a weird one. That's right, this is the summer to keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. The leader in below the belt grooming is making sure that we all have a ball this summer by giving our pants partners everything they need to stay fresh. Dive headfirst into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with our code CHILL20. We've all nicked ourselves down there. That, ooh, ah, that, that sudden sting, the trickle of blood. Oh, you may faint from the damage you've done. Well, with Manscaped, that's a thing of the past. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to prepare that summer body. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold on to all that stuff. And all those nicks and cuts, yeah, that's also not a big concern because their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe tech. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor, a new multifunction on and off switch that can engage a travel lock and gives you the ability to turn the 4,000 LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more, you know, precise shave. And did I mention that this thing is waterproof? Because, you know, beach, lake, shower, it'll do it all. This razor will even devour the strongest pubes. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag that'll bring you comfort to another level. Wearing sandals with some nasty toenails during the summer months? Well, take a look at the Shears 2.0, a luxury nail grooming kit. This kit includes stainless steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. With the performance package, your balls will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest. With the Shears 2.0, look at that, that's a nice little tagline. I like, yeah, that's good stuff right there. Get 20% off in free shipping with code CHILL20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off in free shipping with code CHILL20 at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. So, they were smoking hella weed. Hella that's what weed. Was going on. Being I don't know if weed causes this, but uh, you know. <laughs> San Diego fucking roll tacos and I mean, smoking bong rips at the Coronado <laughs> Hotel. The thing is, and I think you boys are going to see it too, is as we talk more and more about it, you're going to see, we've done a lot of stuff on aliens so far, and you're going to see all of those weird little like nuances of alien abductions kind of come back. For instance, if you remember Betty and Barney Hill, one of the weird things about that abduction is they did not understand zippers. Remember, like they were playing with zippers and uh, like on her yes. dress and they just like did not, for whatever reason, understand zippers. That was a fun detail. Yeah. Yes. We have similar things happening here where they are they don't understand what something is. And so they attempt to use it and it's just awkward. And we'll, we'll talk about it. But we see a lot of those weird little details return in a lot of these cases, which it's like a lot of characters from all the other yeah, stories exactly. of alien UFOs coming together in some kind of convention. Yeah, it's some kind like of a, weird convention. Yeah. So <laughs> with all that laid out, let's start. And we're going to be talking specifically about one abduction case that really is a nice snapshot of what we're looking at here. But first, on the weekend of March 26th and 27th in 1994, the Triad Research Conference Foundation, financed by millionaire and real estate magnate Robert Bigelow, does that sound familiar? If you don't remember that name, he's the man who bought Skinwalker Ranch when we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. So returning characters coming back. I'm already, I'm already highly suspicious now. Like <laughs> this I am, is like when <laughs> radars are pinging everywhere. Boom, 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 boom. I'm freaking yeah. out. Okay. Well, it's sure. like when I see Ron Perlman at a comic convention. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because of him 
that the UFO conference was hosted at the world famous hotel, Hotel Del, Del Coronado. A beautiful Encore. hotel, by the way. Look up a picture. The pictures of are thing. gorgeous of that it's hotel. It's an unbelievable yeah. place. I've walked on that little wooded promenade. It is a. It is. It's like if there was the Shining Hotel, but it was at the beach. It's like if the Shining Hotel was a beach resort. It's exactly that, what it looks like. That's a, that's a phenomenal descriptor, actually. Yeah. It's like dead <laughs> <Yeah>. on. <laughs> um, this is out in what? Yeah, this is in San Diego. The hotel's yeah. in San Diego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the author of this particular book that we're using in the bulk of her research was there during all of this uh, happening. She was there to, she was one of their lecturers for the conference, along with Dr. John Mack from Harvard Medical School and, and abduction researcher pioneer Bud Hopkins from New York, one day we'll talk much more about Bud Hopkins. He's a he's a phenomenal character in the UFOlogy world. He's 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 done a lot of work. Um, and the organizers had asked this author, uh, Yvonne, to be the master of ceremonies. The real event, obviously, being the conference, but for many others, the real event was the mass abduction that occurred between attendees of said conference. Many, but not all, of these attendees happened to be members of her abduction group, which was the uh, organization she founded called CERO, Close Encounters Resource Organization. So most of these people that were abducted were already part of her group. She had already been working with them. Again, people with a history of already having encounters, which does fit that abduction thing where it seems like abduction cases kind of follow family. And like, So do you think it's possible that the only reason that one happened to happen at the event well, was because they like up to the odds because they just brought all the people that this happens to to one place. It could be that uh, there in, in <laughs> we'll talk about this next episode as a closer. There are others who were abducted who have a very traumatic past where it could just be a hallucination for them and it might not necessarily have occurred for them. But then we have cases like the one we're going to talk today where there's actual physical evidence of something ha weird having happened. I don't know if it's necessarily them showing up and being like, ah, easy. It's like throwing a net out and catching a school of fish. Or if it's like the president was there and maybe they were just like showing what they could do and it didn't fucking matter. This is a theory I heard on another podcast and I liked it. Like <laughs> maybe like I don't fucking know. Like what which, should we do? Uh, f fucking uh, show a force. Go more guck. It's Bill Clinton. We can't <laughs> just show up. Yeah. All right, well, uh, grab somebody else and touch his fucking zipper. I don't know. Fuck. He played the saxophone on Arsenio Hall. I love Arsenio. Yeah. It, it's wild. It's it's <laughs> it's wild that this happened because, you know, it's, it happened at a prominently funded. This is not like a cheap UFO conference. It's a prominently funded UFO conference. This hotel does not come cheap. At exactly. All. Like, it's not cheap. Held in the in a very famously haunted hotel where people did have some ghostly experiences, but I'm not we're not going to be talking about those. If you want to read about them, definitely grab the book. Hold on. Ghosts. Supposedly, yes. One are aliens. I that? mean, that's another theory. I mean, it's Bam, very stop possible. This. Stop this. Boom. <laughs> Cut this out. At the Hotel Coronado, ghosts yeah. are aliens. There you go. Bam. Boom. Done. It's a whole new theory. And at the same exact time that this conference was happening. President Bill Clinton had an impromptu visit with his with all of his Secret Service agents happening, uh, following him around on this this entire weekend getaway, so to speak. Again, he was there due to an ambassador showing up. So that's like the scene. That's why what happened here. This is this so is, funny to me. Isn't Where it? Is it's it? such a fun story. It's in, I'm like, I'm so excited. I'm very jittery right now. <laughs> like nobody He's talks like, about this case. Like I only found out about this case through another podcast. Shout out last podcast on the left. That the Do you only think maybe there's a reason no one talks about this case. No, because it, it reminds <laughs> me because we talked. Do you remember that Australia case where everybody all the like a bunch of kids saw an alien landing? But there's yeah. like nothing out there about that beyond like one news interview and like one or two books. I would say Coronado is more heavily covered than that than that one. And even then it's sorely lacking luckily what we have is very detailed so we don't have to like pick apart a ton and try to like guesstimate what happened and also bill clinton was there chilling yeah it, it's it's crazy it, the, the secret service were actually mingling amongst not like hanging out but like walking amongst them because <laughs> the aliens no no no, no 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 the conference members and whatnot and the author notes you remember secret service like walking by and just eyeing her badge at one point, not like in a suspicious way, but just that they were around and they were very clearly like- That's what their job is. Yeah, yeah they're I mean, doing what, what they're they do. supposed yeah. to be doing. Not, nothing 
uh you know super weird about that i just love that he's like a like a background character in the story like when you go see fucking hideo kojima and cyberpunk in the first yes mission. like like that's how i imagine bill bill clinton in this story like he's just like i don't know they just sent me down here that's cool <laughs> and no uh, I'm supposed to meet some ambassador i don't know yeah Aliens. Clinton, so i'm not sure the details are actually clinton <laughs> he had accepted an invitation from u.s ambassador to switzerland larry lawrence who uh, to vacation at his Coronado Oceanfront mansion, Crown Manor. And he was then going to give a speech at the Hotel Coronado that Sunday while the UFO conference was in full swing. So that, he was there to vacation with an amb- with the Switzerland ambassador, the U.S. I'm Switzerland here to see ambassador. Larry. <laughs> He's just like hanging I'm out here. at the Crown Beach, probably getting a blowy. I'm here to hang out at Larry's beach house. Maybe the, the aliens were fucking Bill Clinton in the back room while he was there. Maybe that's why they were there and they decided... They wanted some order out after, and they just scooped up a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, conference goers. Weirdos. You think you think yeah. that's what happened? You think that's something? Yeah, yeah. I think that might be a good. Come on now, it's a little All something. Right. No, I mean, like, yeah, no, it checks out. <laughs> it's, I'm just saying, it, it is what it is. Uh, no, it is what it is. Exactly. Right. I, I, I can't get into this. Was with he you trying right to now. talk? Was he trying to talk to the UFO people? I do not believe that he was. That was what it was for. Private was function, like yeah, a separate private event. function, his own private event, not to the UFO. Uh, folk themselves about the UFOs, but it is curious that Bill Clinton of all people was was there. But today, we're going to be specifically be talking about the abduction case of a woman by the name of Alice. Alice is one of the many that were abducted at the Coronado uh, abduction scenario. And much like many of them, she had a small history of weird encounters with creatures that one could interpret as aliens. In fact, we're going to talk a little about her history, her history right Did now. Did you get a call from the aliens lawyers or something? Yeah, yeah. She got an alien lawyer <laughs> People call. People that you could perhaps refer to in certain circumstances as. <laughs> Listen, you got to leave everything vague because people, you know, people don't know. Some people believe aliens are demons and vice That's versa. True. You know, you got to, yeah. you never know. But Or like me, ghosts when are aliens. <laughs> When she was uh, asked to recount the events that occurred in her family over many years as she grew up, uh, this is what she had to say, quote, for over 10 years, 1970s through the late 80s, Bill would wake up screaming, that's her husband, that someone was near the bed. He would shout, who's there, who's there? One time in the late 70s, he jumped out of bed screaming and ran down the hall. Other times he would just become very anxious before finally lying back down and going to sleep. In the early 90s, Bill had a flash of memory after seeing Yvonne Smith's presentation at MUFON in Santa Barbara. He stated to me that he remembered there were three shadows, short and tall, by our bed those nights. In the late 1980s, I always had the same dream. I would wake up and see figures in the hallway coming toward our bedroom. I would get very scared, then would remember that we had our two dogs downstairs, and my reasoning would be that no one could be in the house or the dogs would bark. At the end of October 1993, I went to bed around 12.20 a.m., and shortly thereafter woke up with a panicked feeling that there was a presence in our bedroom. I remember my heart pounding so hard that I thought I would have a heart attack. The next thing I remember is trying to scream, but I couldn't. I tried to wake up, but I couldn't. Then I remember a bright light coming through my closed eyelids and a feeling of moving very fast, as if I was on an amusement park ride. Then I was able to open my eyes really wide. I was finally awake and I felt very nauseous. Then I fell back asleep. I was very upset. This experience was very distressing to me. In one morning in January of 1994, Bill woke up very upset. He had a burning mark on, quote, his privates. It was very painful. What's a burning mark? It, it was, Wait, what is I'm that? about to explain to you. <laughs> okay. It was very painful and he stated it was as if the top layer of his skin was gone. He also stated that it was a triang- it was triangular shaped. This mark was about one half to one inch in length. So he had like a, um, again, you know, looking back to the Betty and Barney Hill case that we covered in the past, Barney had unfortunate genitalia problems after as well. Now, this is more, it seems like something was cut away, not necessarily like him getting sick or developing some sort of like growth or anything, but again, a more painful experience and he had no memory as to why. He just had a burnt, he had like an acid, acid burn. Yeah, triangular triangle. shaped and he said it felt like the top layer of his skin had been taken off. Like, was it bloody? Like was it raw? It looked I'm a, it looked raw, and that's why they I th- like a chemical burner, like a chafe. Yeah, I would guess like a burn. He said burning red mark. It didn't say it was a burn. It was a burning red mark. He was describing the pain. Okay, as so it was burning. red and like triangular shaped, and it as said if the skin as if was rubbed raw, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's yeah, maybe like a better way to look at it. 
Uh, continuing, she says, in March of 1996, I awoke during the night because my right ear was throbbing with pain. This continued until I finally got up and took some aspirin and fell back asleep. When I awoke, the pain was still continuing at a pace of about one stabbing pain per every couple of minutes. That entire day, I had a bad headache, nausea, and generally not feeling well. I felt that something was put into my ear as my ear has not felt right since, feeling very sensitive and hurts often. A few weeks later, Bill was getting dressed when I noticed claw marks on his left arm. They looked like cat claw marks, but we don't have a cat. There were five scratches, red and raised, and we had no idea where they came from. Now, that's interesting because that fits haunting style things. This isn't happening at the hotel. This is all still her home personal stories. And I'm not saying it's from that. Could be a tool that was used. Hell, he could have just scratched himself on something and not remembered it. But it's it's interesting to pull that out just because people have red scratch marks that appear that claim to be being scratched by ghosts or a poltergeist or a demon or whatever. What's crazy is the other day, maybe like three or four days ago, right across my chest, I had like two big scratch marks. I don't know where they came from. Never once was I like ghosts and aliens. I was just like, where the hell did, okay. <laughs> What's your best guess? What's your best guess? No clue. Maybe I, think, like, I, I don't know. I have no, I couldn't shirtless? tell you. Do you scratch yourself? You maybe you scratched yourself in your I, sleep. I, 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 maybe, honestly, I do not know. And I couldn't hmm. tell you. And I honestly would assume it's something I did rather hmm. than some other outside force, which I think is the sure. difference between myself and someone like this, where they saw, where they would see and be like, if I didn't do that, who did? I was like, I must have done that. I don't know when the hell I did that, but I clearly did that at some point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, I, I agree. I think for the most part, I would feel the same way. But, you know, putting herself in her shoes, if she's been having these weird things happen all the time, I could see someone who's already paranoid jumping to what might be the non-logical conclusion first and then working back, which is you know, how all these you know, people who believe they've been abducted and haven't actually been abducted have kind of like built these fantasies or these delusions for themselves. As the biggest hypochondriac yeah. that I know. Oh God, Googling I, anything ever just always leads me to cancer. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying me, I'm, I'm a huge hypochondriac and I know how powerful the mind is at convincing you of things that yes. are not even possible. Which is an excellent point to keep in mind uh, and a reminder that uh, Yvonne Smith here is a, a a a doctor and a therapist and what have you but her, her specialty is hypnotherapy now granted she went to an accredited college for hypnotherapy but when we start talking about the regression uh, the regressive sessions much like we did with betty and barney hill um you got to keep in mind that this is happening under hypnosis we do not unfortunately have the uh vocal recordings like we do from betty and barney hill we only had those because their family members released them after their passing so Interesting. um Moving on, let's give now Alice's conscious memory of what she remembers of the Coronado Island uh, experience without any regression. It was March 1994, Friday night. Went to bed. I remember waking Lacey up with one of my nightmares. She had a roommate, Lacey, uh, who was staying with her, also going to the convention, separate beds. Um, the dream that I... Uh, so, so I remember waking up Lacey with one of my nightmares. The dream that I always have that I'm running and someone is chasing me. I also remember seeing a flash of light through my closed eyelids. Woke up with the blanket wrapped around my neck and I didn't feel all well of Saturday. Later found out that I was taken by, and she has in quotes, the grays. I had two regressions with Yvonne Smith, which indicated that they were next to the bed and placed a hand on my shoulder. During the regression, my head started to hurt very badly and Yvonne had to pull me out of hypnosis. Lacey states that she saw light coming through the window over her bed. At that point, she noticed that I was then on the floor between my bed and the closet toward the entry door to our room. I was crying and very upset and trying to hide. I knew why they were there. One of the greys led me to the bed and I laid back down. Then I was taken out the window. Lacey said that she was so frightened that I would not come back and she could hear a man in the next room screaming. She must have fallen asleep as when I returned, this, as when I returned the same way I left, I started crying, which woke her up. And then she saw the blanket wrapped around my neck. So that's her conscious memory of what happened uh, on that night without any regressions. Ooh. And there's a lot there, like very like scattered. Like there is a lot there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can go over it again. Like any part, let me know. I can give you a, a I can copy paste it and send it to you if you want to read it. So they'd been at an alien convention the whole day. No, it was uh, they got there Friday night. The convention wasn't Friday. It was Saturday, Sunday. So it was the night before the first day of the convention. Okay. 
And then they went to the convention afterwards. Yes, but it took them a while to get there because they didn't feel good. And we'll, we'll get to what happens. But that's, again, wow. that's the conscious memory of what she remembers. Again, snippets, little like she's on the, she sees her friend on the floor. She doesn't remember her friend getting there. She remembers getting taken out the window and returned. She remembers them looking like your stereotypical gray aliens, which is another reason I also want to use this as our this episode's experience. Um, and she knew why they were there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Jesse, you look like you might have something you might want to want to say, but I'm not sure. No, I guess I'm, I, there's a lot. So the end of what you were saying is she was gone and then her friend went back to sleep. Is that what you're telling me? At some point, it seemed like her friend, like when she left, her friend right. went back to sleep because when right. she came back, she started crying again and it woke Lacey up and that's what I'm saying. So the yeah. friend, why did the friend go back to sleep? Well, we'll talk, we'll get in, we'll get into it, but grays are, you know, they can kind of just I mean, like, okay, uh, just a lot of questions about traveling like, makes me tired too. Like I get sleepy when I am in a hotel. I like to sleep. Yeah. And honestly, uh, for Alice, after this experience, it still would be months before she actually called Yvonne Smith and uh, booked the, and she says booked a, booked an appointment, finally having enough courage to come, come forward and try to figure out what happened through hypnosis because she just, her fragmented memories of Friday night weren't coming together. It didn't make sense. She didn't, she didn't understand what had happened. And at this point, Alice was uh, like to her, at least to Yvonne, Alice seemed not only curious, but very concerned for her other uh, C, the CERO members, the group she belongs to, who also stayed on the island that weekend. She, like the others, said she needed to know the truth, as painful as the truth might be. So she went under her first hypnosis session on December 15th, 1994. I'm going to give you boys the hypnosis session. One of you can be the doctor. One of you can be Alice. Um, because of how this works, I have to send you a screenshot of it because Kindle is restrictive again <clears throat> which one would you say is the tom part and which one would you say is oh because i don't know who they, those people are good though. question you can't ask <laughs> me question. that when i don't even know solid question <laughs> who question. they are um it matters it matters here's the it first does. part of the conversation i'm going to give you the second part as well because i had to take two pictures of it but um yeah it's it's uh I, I will say tom is alice is that okay does that work okay. whoever all right yeah. i guess i was tom is that what we said that's fine yeah, that's and right. i'll just give you this next screenshot here so those are the two pieces of the conversation. Okay, Alice, we are going to be leaving the present time for just a little while as you allow yourself to go back in time and explore a memory, knowing that this is a very safe time to explore. Now take a deep breath, and as you do, allow yourself to drift back to the month of March 1994. At that time, you took a trip with Lacey to San Diego to attend a conference. Just feel yourself going back to March. Your mind is very sharp and clear. You still got a line, my friend. Oh, is that? I thought that was a stage direction. Is that no, stage that, no, direction? Not stage, it is not stage directions. It is, is, it is just a quote. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Your mind is very sharp and clear, taking deep breaths. So when you are ready, just describe verbally what you and Lacey are doing as you check into the hotel. It was old and dreary. <laughs> we kidded and said it was the Bates Motel. But it was better once we got in there. It grew on us. Alice died right after this. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> she withered away. Uh, okay. Alice, can you describe what the room looks like? It's on the third floor, and it was bright. There are two beds and a TV. I don't see a phone. The bathroom is so little, but it's fine. We're okay here. Side note, you will notice Alice complain about the small bathroom multiple times in her regressions for some reason. <laughs> That's so funny. All right, all right. Let's take a deep breath right now and just allow that day, that Friday, to become later and later. You and Lacey went back to the room after being out socially. You come back to the room and begin to get ready for bed. Taking a deep breath, just describe what you are doing now as you get ready to go to bed. I shower, and Lacey takes the bed by the window, and I have the bed by the door. She wants the fan, and it is cold. Whispering, <laughs> I'm going to See? sleep. <laughs> the stage directions, I guess. <laughs> there are stage Dude, directions. Yeah, there are. Like. It says, after a long pause, Alice describes seeing something. That's I told you. That's Yvonne injecting third, well, like later things. Continue. <sighs> 
I don't know. I gotta... Someone's image? Like there's something in the room. I don't know how it got there. How did it get there? Where did you see the image? Right in front of me. Only for a second there was a light. Only for a second. Okay, Alice. Remember, you're just exploring. Just go with your feeling. Just describe what you were feeling. Do you see Lacey? Uh-huh. Her, her back is to me. It says long silence breathes deeply. Yeah, I was waiting to see if you were going to breathe deeply after the long silence. <gasps> oh, man. Lacey is gasping. She woke me up. My blanket is around my neck. And that's where the first session actually ends. At this point, Yvonne couldn't get her past this point. She was very distressed talking about the blanket. And it just seemed, it seemed like she was getting more and more hysterical. So she ended the hypnosis session here. And that marks the first uh, hypnosis session. We actually have photos of the room. It's a very plain looking hotel room with the two beds. It's nothing special. Um, but yeah, this is where she ended up ending it. And we will move on to the next session here in just a, a moment. It's But it's the blanket part that we will look at as the thing that the aliens, for some reason, it just didn't make sense to them. This blanket that she had made no sense. And it was just very, very bizarre. They thought it was like part of her wardrobe and just like yeah. tie it around her neck more cloth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> looks great, actually. It reminds me of my uh, fashions at home. That will totally fuck with her head, blee blam. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But imagine that's all it is, is just people coming to fuck with, with us because they're just drunk aliens out in space. I would believe that more than anything else. I mean... It's, it would be very More human. Than anything it would be very, else. very human. I feel like if that was well, that's why I feel like if that was the case. They're future uses. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is their, um, mm, these are us from the future, and they're just which like is very possible. <laughs> I got an oh, idea, buddy. It's very, very possible. Um, okay, let's get you. Then the next session that happens is a couple months later, February fourth, nineteen ninety-five. Uh, the holidays kind of came and went. She didn't have time for a second session, so it was a little bit before. The next one happens. Uh, so, yeah, this is session two. And uh, take it away when you're ready, Alice. As I look at this day today, I realize that for a lot of you out there, grilling season is coming to a close. Now, it doesn't mean you have to put away your grilling uh, gear. And honestly, a lot of you will probably grill through the winter anyway, which is good because when you're grilling, you're treating yourself. And when you're treating yourself, you should be treating yourself to the highest quality meats that you possibly can. Hamburgers, steaks, you name it. You should make sure you're taking good care of your taste buds. And that's where Butcher Box comes in. If you don't know what Butcher Box is, it's the best direct to the door meat delivery service that's out there. It's peace of mind. Butcher Box takes the guesswork out of finding the high quality meat and seafood. And you can trust that they're going to give you the good stuff. 100% grass fed beef, free range organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood. All humanely raised, no antibiotics or added hormones. So it's like top of the line goodness. And like I said, it just gets delivered to your doorstep. Free shipping in the continental US and no surprise fees. And you can choose a variety of box plan options from curated to customized and change whatever plan you want to have whatever meats you're looking for. There's a huge range of high quality cuts that are hard to come by at the grocery store and an amazing value here. Take chicken breasts off the grocery list. Butcher Box is offering our listeners an incredible deal right now that they've never offered before. Free chicken for an entire year. You get two pounds of free range organic chicken breasts for free in every order when you sign up at butcherbox.com slash chill. And remember to claim this deal with that free chicken for a year, it's butcherbox.com slash chill. Every time they come out with something like this, it's always impressive. Butcherbox.com slash chill. Two pounds of free range organic chicken breasts in every order for a year when you sign up there. Thanks again, Butcherbox, for sponsoring this episode. <laughs> wow. I was choking, I was like choking a... on my own deep breath. Um, <laughs> it's raining, but the rain stops as we get there. My feet are all wet. I go in the room. There are two beds. The bathroom is so little. We're putting everything in the closet. Jack and Melanie arrive, and I go shopping with them. We go to Seaport Village. It's really nice. Okay, Alice, let's go a little further now. 
You and Lacey have had dinner and decide to go back to your hotel. Just feel yourself now in your room. It's very late and you're getting ready for bed. Taking deep breaths now. <sighs> I'm wearing plaid pajamas. There's some sort of sexual tension between Lacey and I. And I yeah, just... I know. It's, it's weird. It's really <laughs> awkward. But anyway, Lacey's watching TV. Very long pause. I see a flash of light through my eyelids so fast. Like somebody has a flash camera. Bright. I could feel it in my eyes. I love the 1994 lingo. Flash camera. Oh, yeah. Good old flash camera. Just now describe what you were feeling when you see the flash of light. Describe what happens and how you are feeling. I uh, have an image. I, I keep seeing something in the room. I, I, I wonder where Lacey is. I keep checking her. I keep looking to see if she's there, but I keep thinking she's gone. Just describe what you sense in the room. Just verbalize what you are sensing or seeing. It's so... It, it's so... She moves around on the couch because she's agitated. They're... Big head. <laughs> uh, They're big head. Uh, okay. What a calm, perfect calm delivery. Down, <laughs> calm down, Alice. Oh, my God. Hey there, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for Rocco. Let us know Blink. he's somewhere in the hotel. We're Tiger here he's Blinkin shacked up with Bill Clinton. <laughs> oh, um, boys. <laughs> it's, I, I can't say more. It got in between us. It's next to the bed, between the beds, in between my bed and Lacey's bed. It's just standing there. It's one of them. He has big eyes. I, I keep thinking that some type of, uh, I, I don't know, uh, some kind of uniform or something on him? Can you describe the uniform? It just seems like it's wearing something. It's dark and, and light. Referring to the color. I'm on my right side and I keep checking on Lacey. I have to check her to make sure she's there. Is Lacey there? Can you see Lacey's bed? <gasps> no, I can only see this thing. Oh, I, I'm getting a headache. Where does your head hurt? Now, before we move on to the next part, uh, at this point in the session, not only does she indicate her forehead hurts, she begins to cry. She indicates that she's feeling pain in her arm, like her entire arm, not a spot on her arm. And no matter how much Yvonne pushed, she couldn't, there was no way for her to uh, describe what was causing the pain. She was crying, but she couldn't get at like why she was feeling this pain. But in a couple of times in the hypnosis, she does shout out, I'm not supposed to remember. I'm not supposed to tell you, which is, again, interesting because people tend to forget their alien encounters a lot of the time. And one of the theories, and, and I don't know if it's true or not, is, again, the brain can be looked at as like a fleshy computer. And if they are, even, you know, however millions of years ahead of us technologically, if the grays are more machine than, than bio biological or anything like that, do they know how to interface? They might not do a great job at it, but maybe they can quickly, you know, do something to block a memory. Uh, but again, that's obviously in the more spiritual look at aliens. I don't know how you would describe that. The mushroom look at aliens, maybe, or like the, the sci-fi. mushroom look. Yeah, you know, right. like, uh, like, yeah, that's your description. You that hippy dippy version. The, but yeah. it's interesting that where she's actually verbalizing that it seems like she's unable to do so. Uh, but yeah, from then on, you may continue. Now, Alice, you are doing fine. You are safe now and just reporting what is happening. As you're lying there and you take a good look around your room, look towards Lacey's bed and just tell me what you're sensing or seeing. I can't see her. I, I, I don't know. I, I keep thinking she's gone. I have to check on her. Oh, she's there. But I, I don't think she was there before. What made you think she wasn't there before? I don't know. I keep opening my eyes to look to make sure she's there. And I don't know why she's sleeping facing me. Now, Bug, uh, another inter uh, interesting note here is Lacey was going through regressions as well because uh, she was having fractured memories of that whole night as well. And uh, it was the other way around with her. Lacey would say she was in the room and that Alice was missing and that she couldn't see Alice in the room. So they were both having similar experiences when it came to the other person's presence within the hotel room itself. Uh, 
Who knows? It could be the the Yvonne goes on to speculate that it might be denial by them. Um, they could also be subconsciously unable to face the fact that they were both truly abducted and that was a traumatic. So they like block it out. Who knows? You may continue. Unless you have something else to add, you may continue. As you look around the room, Alice, do you still see that person standing between the beds? I, I see an image in my head of whatever it is. I don't know if it is still there, but I think it is. The room is dark. I'm so tired. I, I don't feel good. Just take a deep breath right now and let's back up just a little bit in this memory. Become aware of the pain in your head and your arm. Keep feeling it. And just describe what is causing that pain. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It hurts. It aches. Oh. Then she started crying. Are, you are doing just fine, Alice. Just get a sense of the room. Do you feel that person is still there between the beds? Yeah. Up by my head. Close, extremely close, just looking at me. It won't go away. Oh, it's leaning over me. I have a headache and I, and I want to go away. My head hurts. My arm, he's touching my shoulder. I see his hand. Good job, boys. I'm so proud of you. Oh, you, you Don't you worry. Know. I'm just looking for my friend Rocco. <laughs> no big deal. That stupid little boy. <laughs> he's caused me so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a phenomenal performance. Um, I appreciate it. We got more more coming along the way. We Have got a small you seen break. William Jefferson Clinton? <laughs> Yvonne continues on at this point to note that at this right around here, it once again became painfully slow in the session. And I also want to point out too uh, about Yvonne is much like the uh, the Betty Barney Hill case. She's I appreciate you know hyp hypno hypnotherapy and aggressive therapy is already a very wishy washy. Kind of method already because as we talked about hypnotherapy back in those episodes you can very easily accidentally plant a memory that doesn't exist influence their thoughts you know make them believe something's not real and i you know yvonne is very good about just trying to be general in what she's asking not specifically saying like aliens or anything just constantly guiding her to describe what she sees describe what she feels which is Good, because if it was anything else, it would throw much more doubt into all of this. Yeah, so it seemed to her that Alice was having some sort of like weird tug of war of trying to like explain what's happening, but still not able to explain. Um, and she, but at least she recalled a little bit more this time chipping away at what, you know, the, the iceberg of what is sitting under the surface for at this point. And Yvonne continues to say that it's interesting for her to note that even when she suggested to Alice that she was coming back to the present time, she continued to describe the being leaning over her and touching her shoulder. It took her several minutes for Alice to finally concentrate on her, her voice and directions before she fully came back from that hypnotherapy. Uh, she was very traumatic. And I'm actually going to send you a picture of the sketch of what it, she said, how close he was. This is right out of the book. Who drew this sketch? She did? Uh, I don't know who drew the sketch. I, don't, I think she described it, and this was just like a sketch that was... Um, done for the book. Oh my god! Just a typical gray. I mean, what you're it's seeing like there. Cinematic. Yeah, it's just like a, a gray face in your face, and it, that would set me to panic if that's what she no, was seeing. You saw this, you would be like, "Well, I might be rock hard." There'd be like, but a, be ready like to a tear go, going down the side. Why of your eye. are you? I want to. I want to point out that I did not say the part about his penis. No, I, I did. Say, yeah. <clears throat> I just hundred percent. If you come to the live show, you might hear a lot more. I, uh, you will. I'm gonna that's go what I'm worried about. Will. Everyone Ooh. who comes to the live show, they come to like, they're going to talk about aliens. It'll be fun. And it's and we do. an hour and a half of Mathis being like, all right, demon or alien. I'm going to stick my dick in that. Every <laughs> show. <laughs> and if you're telling me you wouldn't, you're lying. Last time, last <laughs> time we did the show, he took off his Crocs and put them into sport mode before he started the show. <laughs> He did, he did do Crocs. that. He did do that. He did. Weed leaf Crocs and <laughs> before the alien section. Mode. Before yeah. we, before the alien section, we put them. I, I forgot. We about they were weed leaf Crocs. Oh yeah, baby. You want to see those? Those will be worn oh. during the live show in LA as well. All right. <laughs> the only pair of shoes he owns, guys. <laughs> he has no options. Oh, I don't have any other options. He's wearing the weed leaf Crocs, dude. <laughs> they're coming. They're coming they're, to LA. They're baby. part of the show at this point. They're getting on. This the plane. explains why we have a majority male audience. It all checks out, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> we like to put sense. out the warning signs. We like to Buck stop. Buck the trends, Except, baby. Hey, yeah. ladies, I see you in true crime. You show Don't, up. Mm. You say do. The, the, at true crime, and when we do our true crime episodes, the, the, the female viewer statistic demographic Shoots up like twenty percent, but like it, the fact it that they don't stick around up. says a lot about the show. <laughs> they, just, they just come back for the true crime. You know what I mean? They just come back for the true crime. <laughs> um, but let's uh, let's push forward a little bit because we're about to get to the physical evidence that exists that something happened to Alice that night. That something weird or strange happened because during that de the, that session, as it continued, Alice would continue to say things like, "quote I keep seeing that thing." They wouldn't let me come back. I, I couldn't come back. I could hear your voice and I was trying to come back and it wouldn't go away. So that's how she describes being brought back from the hypnosis session when she was being debriefed about it. Um, and something, the big thing that we're going to talk about now is what Alice noticed in her body when she came back from Coronado in 1994. She says, quote, it was weird because it wasn't like I found it. It was like I was told to look at my leg in that spot. I mean, I was in the bathroom getting ready for bed and I remember a voice saying, check your leg. And I went, oh my God, what is that? I didn't know there was anything underneath it, but it looked weird. It looked like it was a kidney bean shaped and my skin was shiny right under there. Like the top layer of skin was missing. And now I'm going to give you some photos. Now these are contextless other than they're clearly x-rays for the moment. I'm also going to hand you guys the doctor's papers mm. from the hospital, uh, the report on the actual thing in her leg. So you have that for a reference. And she continues to say, <clears throat> it happened when I was section director. Uh, Roger, Roger arranged to do some surgeries with two other patients. Uh, and well, I'm, I think I'm ahead. Hang on a second. Ooh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. So she saw the thing, kidney bean, kidney bean shaped. And uh, she had arranged to do some surgeries with two other. Roger arranged to do some surgeries with two other patients. And one of the patients backed out. He was deathly afraid that something would happen to him if he had his object removed. So what we're saying is this doctor had multiple people from the Coronado experience, uh, the, the event, come to him with something in them. Um, so Alice said, I asked Roger if he wanted to get rid of this thing on my leg. We went to his office and he x-rayed it. And I wondered why he was x-raying it because it was just a little mark. Roger explained it was protocol for his practice. So he took x-rays and he says, there's something under it and I couldn't believe it. I remember it really made me sick to look at it. I don't know why, but it would really bother me. I hated this thing and I really wanted to get rid of it. So when the opportunity came up, I thought he would just be able to get rid of the scar. I had no idea there would be anything under it until the x-ray came back. I didn't even know there was an object under there. So the reason the doctor says it's part of practice, if you're ever going to cut or work on, on skin or a body part, you need to make sure that, you know, there's not something underneath that can cause problems, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there is right. something there. So it's not like a conspiracy reason that he was checking these things. Uh, Yvonne actually speaks with Roger and gets some more details on the actual mark and what, what it was. Uh, and he goes on to say that these reports are on pathology of the, of the sample that was removed from Alice Levy and the date of collection of May 18th, 1996, we used multiple laboratories and accumulated a large amount of information, which we separated and then put in categories afterward, looking for similarities and differences between the different laboratories, which makes fucking sense. It's science. Alice had approximately a three to four millimeter oval shaped lesion on the front of the calf of the left leg and was slightly pinkish in discoloration, indicative of a typified a typified mark seen in abduction patients. The uh, again, like a very small mark. Now you can you guys have the photos. There's one of the X-ray and one of the leg. You That's can the you same... can see the mark yeah. in the leg. It's black and white, but you still can see that very very tiny mark. Um, yeah. This is this mark is colloquially colloquially categorized by the doctor uh, as a scoop mark. This is what he calls these like uh, alien, maybe alien abduction marks that he's dealt with. This was also done on an additional patient who had a marking on the shin in the exact same area of the exact same leg. Both surgeries were performed on the same day. Uh, first reference to the pathology report 001.004 with specimen number 56365652 under comments microscopic diagnosis, there is a noted fibrosis with solar elastosis. Now, solar <laughs> elastosis is the overexposure of skin to large amounts of ultraviolet. 
This is a significant finding because this patient was a housewife in occupation and daily activity and spent no time with all over sunlight uh, exposure. So in with a very tiny, small millimeter area of her leg, it was very strange that this was one of the findings. There was also no evidence seen in the significant chronic inflammation and no other histological changes of foreign body reaction, which holds for the other patients that we have removed foreign bodies in the face of possible non-terrestrial abduction. Basically saying the body wasn't rejecting this thing. There's a millimeter piece of her skin that shows evidence of the fibrosis solar elastosis, which is UV overexposure, and there's no other evidence that it was anywhere else. And two patients on the same left leg in the same spot on the shin had it, and the, sa the surgeries for both of them happened the same day. <clears throat> I apologize, pretty, my voice is going a little bit. That's fucking wild, though. Honestly, like, I'm looking at this right now, back and forth again and again, and I'm like, mm -hmm. is that something? I mean, there was a surgery. The yeah. only thing that's weird is this is, like, almost two years later? Yep. It's about two years later, yeah. uh, 1996. I'm going to send you the next x-ray photo as we continue with the doctor's explanations of what we're seeing, <clears throat> just so you have it. Again, uh, guys, if you have Kindle, you can go get this book, read it on Kindle. Uh, the photos are, you know, from the book. I would, if you if you have any passing interest in alien abduction stuff and want to look at it from like a, you know, this kind of angle of just examining it from a therapist's angle or doctor's perspective, this book is great. It's phenomenal. Definitely go check it out. Um, the second report by an additional laboratory also reports the same finding of solar elastosis. And we have another That's one. So which, weird. Yeah. And we have another one which verifies no chronic inflammatory <coughs> response, which is highly unusual in any foreign body case. It should be noted that below the excised skin legion, a small BB sized whitish gray ball was uh, extracted. So it is a ball that they're scooping they're taking out of her leg going into alien abduction territory for a second in my own my own knowledge this falls in line very interestingly with aliens who are known to put implants in people because when they are taken out it looks like nothing it, there's no machinery there's no like circuits it's always this weird small object that could look like a pebble or a scrap of metal, but the same thing where it doesn't look like the body ever rejected it. The wound itself is strange and makes no sense. And, and uh, it's it's very, very interesting. Um, we it's will, we will continue. Dragon's glass. Yes, it was made with dragon's glass. Uh, <clears throat> again, the solar elastosis and all that stuff is just important that it was found by multiple laboratories, not just one. And same thing with the actual object itself. One of the other important findings, it should be noted though, in one of the labs and was a report of hist uh, history, histriocytes, which contains, which contained reflectile yellow brown pigment, which is suggestive of hemosiderin, which is iron stain of like the blood. Like that's uh, the color that your blood like stains things, I suppose. Um, they say the iron stain confirms the presence of hemosiderin. This is a consideration of an important finding because, again, it seems to be a standard that we find in soft tissue areas surrounding these, quote unquote, non-terrestrial implantations. So, again, there's the, simil the similarities between each one hold 100% true. It's not just one person with this thing. It's multiple people finding the same things in the same part of the body with the same lab findings coming back. So she continues to talk to him. She's very, like, kind of enraptured by this at this point. But Roger goes on to try and like lay it out in layman's terms. So this is going to be his best way of describing it for if in case, you know, you still aren't quite clicking with what he's saying. He says the solar elastosis was a finding in which the skin has been exposed to an overabundance of ultraviolet light. And when the whole person is not exposed to large doses of ultraviolet light, it is indicative that something created this overexposure to the ultraviolet light. So in the face of the testimony of numerous abductees worldwide, we had medical procedures done of a non-terrestrial nature. Therefore, possibly is an instrument which can scoop out a small segment of the superficial epidermis, which are the outer layers of the skin, and then seal the wound with ultraviolet. That's why I think this is a very significant finding. This is the uh, doctor's opinion. The other finding uh, here, we when we talk about hemosiderin, hemosiderin is an iron pigment. It's very similar to what is in the red cells, which is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin combines with oxygen with the oxygen molecule within the red cell and is carried about the body given uh, given up in the area that's needed. 
Then a molecule of carbon dioxide is taken aboard within the red blood cell. And of course, the red cell then passes through the lung, gives up the carbon dioxide and exchanges it for another molecule of oxygen. So hemosiderin is a cousin to what we find in the red blood cells or the hemoglobin. It's very important because the oxygen uh, nutriment or the circulation surrounding foreign material, not earth-based, is evidently using this primitive mechanism to oxygenate or keep whatever biological tissue that's been implanted alive inside the body. So that's like their, his best theory as to what's going on and what hemosiderin is and why it's important. But he, he does continue, and I really want to go through all of the stuff he talks about here because it helps kind of put uh, perspective on things here. Right, but like, um, just for the record, this is please, please abduction do. one of many you're talking about that happened to this place? Correct. So next episode, we're not going to dive into them as deeply as we're diving into this one. We're diving into this one because it's such a perfect snapshot of what was a regular kind of uh, occurrence of like evidence plus memories plus hypnosis and whatnot. But other people had wildly different experiences. I mean, like, I might Smoke dispute. and aces only happened the way it did because he went to that hotel. You know I what mean, I'm part saying? of the reason this is so fascinating is because it hap all this happened to a bunch of people at a UFO conference of all places uh, while the president was around of all things. I don't know. I might dispute that one case extrapolates to all the cases there. It doesn't. No, no, it doesn't fully extrapolate. But, but again, it's like it's a good smorgasbord of like commonalities that happen throughout. Again, this was not the case for everybody by any stretch. In fact, not ev not everybody even saw grays, which is why this is another fascinating case. Just, there were people who saw tall whites. There were people who say they spoke with Nordics. There was people who said they were being taken by the praying mantis bug, bug I would aliens. love to know the timetable for all this because as a standalone event, sure, the two of these people being taken by grays or whatever mm -hmm. is interesting, but all of it together, and then the timeline of them discovering all this information being a year, two years, et cetera, after mm -hmm. the fact. After the initial event, were, was everyone talking about this? Did they all communicate about like the thing? Because I have to imagine over time, all this comes becomes more corrupted and more twisted by the fact that now everyone has other ideas of what occurred. And like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I It's we, interesting as hell. We, in the in like as a standalone thing, but the minute you put 100%. it in the context of like everyone that was getting abducted, then suddenly even this becomes shaded so, by that. Yeah, I will. I can I can answer your question immediately. They all started talking about it the next morning when when they all woke up feeling sick. No one like they were not coming out for breakfast. People were knocking on their doors, and then when they eventually did all come together, they didn't say like aliens. Everybody's like, I don't. They didn't fully immediately remember. They were like. Did you have a weird night last night? Yeah, I don't feel great. I mean, they didn't and say it, but let's be honest. They were fucking thinking that shit. May, I mean, yeah, but I imagine that's <laughs> like very mean? weird. Yeah. But that's going to be a conversation for the next episode and not, you know, for, for this particular one. Again, why I want to do mo like three episodes on this thing, because it's I think it's worth really pulling this apart as much as we possibly can in, you know, three hours, essentially, or two hours. Um, right. So, OK, so, yeah, that's uh, continuing moving forward. Um, what else the doctor was saying uh, is that, he, she, you know, Alice asked her to interpret the second report that he received from the laboratory. So, again, this is his interpretation of what the report, the report findings say. He says, well, this is a different laboratory. Again, we use multiple labs, as I originally stated, to look at the results because different people, different experts in the field looking at the same thing might see something else. Now, it's significant here that they also noted fibrosis with solar elastosis. Again, as I stated before, solar elastosis is an overexposure of ultraviolet. So this is an additional same finding of another lab in the fibrosis. When they talk about the laying down of fibrous tissue around the foreign body, which is not necessarily a rejection or flammatory reaction, it's just something that maybe stabilizes the foreign body to keep it from flopping around. I think it's more intentional in these cases than something you get when the body is trying to repel an object. He's saying that just when a body is typically trying to repel it, it's loose, it's looser in there. It's more, there's more wiggle room for it to kind of yeah, get out. Like it, and these whatever are they like, did made them welcome it. Basically, yeah, they, right? like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They like welcomed it in, soldered it down, you know, that kind of shit. Um, they were also looking over the x-rays at the time. And he goes on to say that, as you know, x-rays are only good for looking at objects which are more radio dense than the surrounding bone. These x-rays here are marked so we can see the area of involvement, 
and they don't particularly show that there is anything there, which again, as I showed you that picture initially, should answer your question, Alex. We have one here with two air arrows to mark the area. Uh, this one does show a slight round area in the middle of the two arrows, which is indicative of something within the soft tissues, apparently not normally there. This is another one where we found two small radio dense areas, and these turned out to be an artifact, which means they are not real and only appear as a defect in the emulsion of the film. So, you know, false positives do happen, is, is, is what he's saying on these x-rays. Uh, but then she goes on to ask, like, when you say they're not real, what does that mean? He says they are not real as far as an object, but could have been a little mark or defect in the film or emulsion covering the film. There is this is another of the leg, which apparently doesn't show very much with the marker indicating where the lesion was. And on this one, we have little markings here, little spots that we can see, which are all over the film. So those are artifacts. Again, we also took x-rays of Alice's foot looking for something but these were also negative for foreign bodies. Uh, the true foreign bodies were seen in the CAT scan, and even those were not, didn't jump out at you, in other words. So the idea is like, they're like stealth mode. Yeah, so like an X-ray isn't gonna pick them up very easily. The only way they actually saw it under the skin was a CAT scan. So, you know, yeah, exactly, stealth mode. You gotta work a little harder to find it in the skin. Um, but he said even in the CAT scans, they weren't mega obvious, they didn't jump out at him. Uh, he said, in other words, the grayish white ball that, that she had was more or less a shadow that we saw beneath the skin, which we didn't expect to see in the first place. But the intent was to go in and remove the entire lesion of the skin because she was going in to fix the scar initially, um, which was a scoop mark to see what in the heck makes scoop marks. The x-rays we did just to see if there was anything underneath, and we did, we found what looked like a little grayish ball, a little grayish white ball of calcium, but it was not calcium. I think it's important in this case, as far as Alice is concerned, it should be noted that two surgeries were done on the same day. The other one was on another female of approximately Alice's age. She also had a scoop mark in the exact same place that Alice had, and she also had a little whitish gray ball that was removed at the same time that we removed the superficial lesion. Where are in those addition, now? What? Where are those little balls now? Well, we'll, we got, we'll keep going because okay. <clears throat> they, they got it sent off for testing and we'll tell you what the test broke down into. In addition, she had a bout of pain at exactly the same time as Alice, which was approximately two months following the surgery. We were both engaged in different activities and both called because they had a certain bout of pain in the surgery site. I don't have an explanation for it. It shall remain one of those mysteries, but it indicates from what we know, linkage between these two individuals. Maybe the ETs were messing with one, were also involved in the other, but that's just a guess. <clears throat> uh, he continues to say, we should say from a medical standpoint and a psychological standpoint that Alice is essentially normal. And she did have a few blood findings that are indicative of high cholesterol, but hello, she is a normal, regular person and essentially in good physical, physical health. And so was the other individual who had the same marking. It is also interesting to note that the lab reports are almost identical to Alice's. Of course, I don't recall if she also had an elevated cholesterol, but she was certainly within the physiological norm, lab-wise and health-wise. But the solar elastosis was there too. It was so amazing to see that in two individuals. Holy crap, my voice is disappearing. That is wild though. That <clears throat> it's is genuinely awesome. compelling. It's fucking yeah. wild. It's genuinely compelling information. Yeah. And like, I, I appreciate them going to clarify and being like, this doesn't mean this, but you know, here's my personal opinion. He's not injecting his opinion of what's happening as the right opinion. He's approaching it both as like a doctor and then his own personal uh, per opinion. Thanks to Beauty Counter for sponsoring this episode. Beauty Counter is a leader in the clean beauty industry with the collective mission to get safer products into the hands of everyone. They believe that beauty should be good for you. This is why they created a variety of clean skincare and beauty products such as Dew Skin Tinted Moisturizer. This daily makeup meets skincare tinted moisturizer with SPF 20 provides sheer, lightweight coverage for a dewy, luminous finish. And it helps achieve even looking skin tone and protect skin against the sun's damaging rays. 
They offer an all bright skincare line containing their best selling all bright vitamin C serum, triple acid AHA toner, and all bright facial oil. The line supports an even skin tone and helps improve the appearance of dark spots and to brighten your skin. Another one of their best selling products is their obsessively clean mascara, which achieves ultimate lift length, and volume without potentially harmful ingredients. And best one of all is their Countersun Daily Sheer Defense for face and body with SPF 25. It guards against the sun's damaging rays with this daily SPF 25 facial sunscreen formulated with non-nano zinc oxide provides broad spectrum protection against UVA and UVB rays. You can layer it over your daily moisturizer or under your makeup. It's a lightweight, fast absorbing, and easily blendable formula that goes uh, on with no that goes on with no white case, ideal for all skin tones. And right now, they're offering 30% off your first order, in case you needed another reason to switch to a clean routine. All you have to do is use our code CHILL to save 30% on your first order. That's 30% on your first order from Beauty Counter. Thanks again to Beauty Counter for sponsoring this episode. Alice's surgery and that of her counterpart both of those surgeries were under local anesthetic. They did not have any general anesthesia and they experienced the surgery well. Also, the physio physiological aspects was in the norm prior to the surgeries, as was in relative norm following the surgery. And the, do the doctor says he doesn't remember specific comments that Alice made, but he says he thinks she might have talked about relief knowing that this was finally gone and out of her body, like the lesion was, take the lesion was taken care of. Um, so he, he felt good. He said he kind of feels like it was nice to give abductees a newfound feeling of freedom, essentially. Now, we do have the report of what this thing was. And it's interesting because it's nothing special. Um, I will give you the report here. Let me just go over it. The report is, uh, the person who inspected it was a professor of geology, um, uh, R.K. Smith is the man. The object taken from Alice Levy's leg was delivered to the Earth and Physical Science Lab at the University of Texas in San Antonio for analysis by X-ray diffraction, XRD. It was then analyzed by geology professor R.K. Smith. XRD is a technique which measures the diffracting of X-rays of known energy through the layers of atoms in a crystalline sample. This analysis can provide information on the spacing of atoms in the sample and therefore the atomic and molecular structure of the material being analyzed, which kind of goes back to last week's minisode where you talked about keeping something in a state where atoms have to line up in a certain way to be liquid or yeah. solid. That's what this is actually yeah, literally talking about. Phase shifting. Yeah, this is literally called, talking yeah. about how they're trying to figure out what it is. How are the atoms aligned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the results of the XRD analysis indicated that the material which the object is composed of is amorphous. It had no crystalline structure and therefore no ordered arrangement of atom, atoms or ions. This is quite unusual as the vast majority of common substances have some traces of crystalline structure. It is my conclusion, therefore, that the powdered material collected from the unknown sample is amorphous and therefore lacks any internal ordered arrangement of atoms or ions. In simpler terms, he says, one, what? the object was very hard. Two, x-rays were passed through it, both as an intact, intact object and in powder form. Three, no regular pattern of x-ray scattering were observed. No, like peaks of x-rays or anything like that indicating right. that the object has a random and non-crystalline arrangement of atoms. And four, this type of structure is often termed amorphous or glassy. And we have a picture of some of the stuff. This is from 2008. It gives a, I think it's just an example of what these things can look like. <clears throat> okay. I'm just gonna send you a picture for scientific reasons. Do they, do these things still we'll exist? We'll get to that. I think it's still in a lab somewhere okay. though, is the short answer. I think they do have okay. it. It's not like gone, gone. Okay. <clears throat> it didn't just turn into sparkles? And no, it didn't just disappear into sparkles. Like they have all the paperwork for it. Like it's evidence that it was real, all that good stuff. Um, Whoa. Yeah. This is yeah. crazy. So from 2008? This is from 2008. Yep. That's an October 27th, Northern Arizona University research photo. <clears throat> Uh, so they really never stopped looking into it. No. Um, so this continues all the way up to, we're going to jump. That's an object without a crystalline structure, what would be considered amorphous. It's just a piece 
of material, basically, that was pulled from the body that is, you can see how tiny it is. It's like barely an inch long. And they were both like They this? were little, not like this one in particular. This is like an example photo. Theirs were balls. Theirs were tiny little balls. And I, you know, I um, but now we're going to actually jump to April 19th, 2011, where she was able to sit down with Alice again and talk once again uh, about the Coronado experience. And um, let me, this is worth having you guys read. Yeah, this is like the the last big details. This is really freaking long. Um, and I don't know if we need to go through all of it, uh, but I would like to go through some of it. So I'm just going to give you some screenshots, boys, and you're going to start reading these things for me. You take you on the same it, roles dude. as you once have. Uh, this is just a discussion of them talking about what she now remembers of the Coronado experience. And then I am going to give you my final uh, thoughts for this episode, so to speak. This is a this is a fascinating case. I, I, I agree with you. You got me fucking uh, Googling it's, over it's here. Un again, it's unfortunate how I feel like it's not covered like it should be. So, yeah, it, it's 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 man. It's 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 uh, but like, uh, I don't know. I'm in love with it, man. Of course, there's room for doubt, but that's what makes it so interesting because I'm going to introduce even more doubt next episode, not because there looks like there was shenanery, shenanigans happening, but there is evidence that some of these people may have been having, you know, true nightmares or actual halluc like just hallucinations. So this is very clearly a process that's happening here where yeah. we got at the beginning, she didn't remember much. And then suddenly she's remembering things. And now what I'm looking at right now is she's literally telling a story now. And yes, no, so that's why it's important to know this is from 2011. This is not like of the time. It is a little bit of her memories of like the secret but service. But her saying, I, her starting around. with, I remember that day clearly is to me That's, yes, the yes. biggest giveaway that this is. It's like when you're told but by she, your parents so many times you did a thing when you were a kid that now becomes a memory yeah. of, oh, when I was a kid, I did this. But you don't remember it. You just were told it so many times that that is now your memory. And I am like super sus of this kind but of She stuff. did have a ball pulled out of her leg, though. I mean, I've had crazy stuff pulled out of me. I think we all have. They are talking about, like, I'm not trying to, like, nitpick here, but, like, I think they are talking about the daytime right now. And so she might truly remember that day well, but that night she had doesn't remember. She clearly and had, had to have issues. Even she went out moment. and had dinner with people. Everybody was excited. She just remembers the day. Nothing weird, not, like, necessarily happened during the day beyond the, the Secret Service being around. But, you know, I, uh... I think this is like worth reading still, regardless. I remember that day clearly. <laughs> I remember heading over there and it started to rain so hard and we were crossing over that bridge over to the island. It was kind of scary. You were dropping off Lacey and I. You were dropping off Lacey and I at our hotel. Remember, yeah, because they're all part of the same Ciro group atten attending this convention And it was together. pouring. I remember stepping into the gutter. My foot was wet up to my knee just about... My shoes were wet, and Lacey and I got in there, and I asked them where the elevator was, and I opened what I thought was the closet door, and they said, get in? <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. It was like I'd never seen one of those elevators before, but it worked. There's a picture of it. Yeah, there's an actual picture of it. It's got that like rattling metal cage at the front of yeah. it. Yeah, and we went up to our floor, and... You went with us up to our room for a short while. Yes, I did, because I wanted to see your room, and we were laughing because you kept calling it the Bates Motel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and in the uh, bathroom, it was really small, but it was clean. I think Mike and Gina were going to be next to us, but they hadn't arrived yet. They were coming after work. About half an hour later, here comes Jack and Melanie, and because it had stopped raining, they didn't have to unload in any rain. They were in the room up in front facing exercise studio across the... I gave you the link. The very bottom link is the next page, my friend. Across the... Street. Street. So they were facing <laughs> towards the front and we were facing a parking lot. And if you look past the parking lot, you could see the homes on the island. Actually, you could see the street and part of the area where President Clinton was going to be arriving supposedly on Sunday. The house where he was UFO staying. UFO convention? Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, love the UFO convention. The house where he was staying, you couldn't really see because it had gates and it had a lot of greenery around it. It really wasn't a huge lot 
It's a typo on their end. <laughs> it's a huge, a huge lot. huge lot. But I remember it was uh, yeah, it's a, typo twice a real for some reason. huge Hugh house. It was a Hugh house. <laughs> Hugh Grant's Hugh house. Grant's home. <laughs> Two story, but there were gates around it and there were men out there. Security. They were wearing black suits. Secret service. They were getting ready uh, big head. This, <laughs> this Friday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> When we came in, and, and Clinton was supposed to arrive on Sunday, I think. So the first time you remember seeing the Secret Service was around that house? Well, actually, th the first time was later when we saw the Secret Service. I remember Lacey and I... Yeah, no shit. <laughs> I remember <laughs> Lacey and I met you at the Del Coronado. Uh, you were going to regress Lacey, but I think we were going to eat dinner first? We met you and went up to your room, and I remember the wild carpeting in the hallway with the big flowers. I remember my head was feeling weird, like pressure and getting dizzy. It was a weird feeling. That's why I kept asking you if, if you were on the haunted floor, because it felt really strange there. You know, I'm thinking- She was, you, by the way. They were on the haunted floor. <laughs> you can't, okay, just, you can't just say that. Just, you can't just be like, oh, there you was. I'm, just, I'm putting that there as side information that doesn't matter. You know, I, I'm thinking you did regress Lacey before we went to dinner. We went into the big restaurant downstairs, and they had the round tables. It was a huge room. Why do they keep saying that? It's driving me crazy. I don't know why. They, I wonder if someone went control F, <laughs> like an accidentally yeah, replaced. What the fuck? I don't know why I keep saying huge. It's very strange. I think we were strange. eating late because it was not like a dinner crowd at all. So we would have had done the regression first. That was the strangest dinner because I remember we all looked at the price of the menu and we all went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> such a fucking and we all had a salad that. with no dinner and so I, I remember the strangest things as we got our salads they weren't hue they were fine what the fuck is but this? i've never seen so many waiters in my life for three girls there were i think three or four waiters they were standing around our table watching us eat i remember you commented you said my god we've got so many waiters I remember you mentioned it because <laughs> they were standing like cool story, at attention <laughs> around our table with their hands in front of them. And, and there were three of them. They were watching us. Lacey started not feeling good. And she said she was going to walk back to our hotel to get, I think, some aspirin. So she left, but she came back. When Lacey came back, well, she had some very choice words, if I remember, because somebody was following her. Um, kind of pacing her i didn't believe it until she and i walked back to our hotel and, and we were followed yes we had a man in a black suit that was about 20 feet behind us and he was following us he followed us until we got almost to the parking lot of our hotel and then turned and he was pacing us and following us he was secret service yeah interesting the next page is already up there for you alex to graham so what made you feel or think he was with secret service he was dressed in a black suit and he's walking down the street at night following us i didn't see earpieces but he had a suit on and the waiters i mean i'm not a conspiracy person but i can't imagine you're not a get the fuck out. I know. I mean, like, even abducted by aliens, you might be a little bit of a conspiracy person. But I can't person. imagine just having like three or four waiters standing around our table. I mean, the president's in town. You know, everyone's trying to work. Yeah, exactly. Our table, when there are other tables with people, they're all waiting on us. It's almost like I have main character syndrome. And I'm convinced those three waiters were only focused on us. It was crazy. Anyway, we had salads and they were standing around <laughs> watching us. Do you think it was maybe because of what you said? That the restaurant was empty? It wasn't empty. There were people there. It it wasn't full, but there were other people. I think we got really good service maybe because you were the MC main character. The following day, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Lacey and I laughed about it when we were walking back to our hotel. We were like, you must be kidding because that was weird. And we both agreed it was very strange. I remember you commenting about it because... We were trying to talk to you, uh, trying to talk, and you felt awkward because Lacey had a regression, and you were trying to talk about it, and you couldn't because these guys were only about four or five feet in the back of each of us. I mean, they weren't even going away and coming back. They were just there. So what else do you remember from that night? Okay, so then I remember Lacey and I were getting ready to go to bed, and oh, the bathroom's goodness gracious. The bathroom is so little. And you know, Lacey, long arms, long legs, right? I got in my shower, and 
What happened in this hotel room? <laughs> I got tiny bathrooms, man. That's the part that really sticks out for I got her. my shower and, and I was in bed in my jammies all tucked in and she had the bed by the window and I had the bed by the door. And that was the smallest bathroom I'd ever seen. Gina said they're kind of like <laughs> European bathrooms where they have like a little mini sink. It wasn't a full sink. Then I remember falling asleep and um, I was wearing red plaid pajamas, flannel, and I always have like this blanket I bring with me, just a, a little throw blanket oh, I throw over my shoulders. I remember going to sleep and I remember a flash of light, like coming through my eyelids. I could remember that. And then I remember some kind of a, a nightmare which woke her up. I think it woke her up because I was like crying and it woke her up. And when I woke up in the morning, I heard her going, oh, my God. You know, she was upset because I guess when I woke up with that little blanket I had, it was now wrapped around my neck. I think she thought I was strangled. Uh, she was worried I was dead because it was wrapped around my neck. And that's the example of the Greys not knowing what the fuck to do with the neck thing, the neck blanket that she has. And so, like, there's like, I goes here, I guess, and just fucking wraps it around her neck and lays her back to bed. That's so <laughs> weird. My my blanket was just around my neck. It, it wasn't like they were trying to strangle me. It was more like, here's your blanket. Well, I woke up in the morning and Lacey was talking to me. I think she felt really bad because she saw what happened and she was really upset that she caused it. She felt whenever she went away, you know, things happened to her. So she felt responsible what? when she saw me with my blanket wrapped around my neck. She has her, her abduction what? events typically happen when she travels Lacey's. That's what she's referring to. That morning I, I felt sick. I was hot. Even when I peed, it was like burning hot. Almost like when you have a fever and everything is burning. I don't know if I had a fever, but I had a bad headache and, and couldn't focus my eyes. My eyes were really glassy, like when you have a fever and you're sick. By the way, can I just... <laughs> she keeps saying, like, when you have a fever and they were they had yeah. issues the day before. And I'm just curious, did they have a fever? And yeah. did they I mean, hallucinate? We'll talk about like, that maybe they next time. Again, have, like, weird dreams and stuff because they were having a fever, which is a thing that does happen when you have a fever. I've... I've had some weird dreams, yeah. man. We will see, my friend. We will see. There is some. I just. I don't know if I put my eggs in the. Fever All basket. right. <laughs> I just don't think I do. I remember Mike knocking on the door and saying, "You guys ready for breakfast?" And and I said, "No, no. We'll meet you at the little restaurant." There was a restaurant half a block down the street. Uh, so I got dressed and I, I wasn't feeling so good. So I went over to the restaurant and we had breakfast. And I remember Gina saying something about Mike having blood on his pillow. That's the first we had heard what? of something happened mm -hmm. to them. And Lacey, she said she was feeling so much guilt. Like she had brought this upon all of us. Like it was all her fault. In fact, it, it finally came out and she told me uh, what had happened in our room that night. She said they went right by her that they didn't even want to, any part of her. They entered through the window. The bright light was through the window and, and Mike's too. Mike's light came in through his window. They came in through the window, which are windows where w would have been Clinton's house where he was staying. If a bright light were shining from there at that house, they definitely would have seen it as bright of a light as Lacey described. It would have been very visible to anybody within blocks and they were within two blocks or less probably a block and a half. So Lacey said they went right by her and mo and, uh, and over to me. And I guess I saw them coming and, and jumped out of bed and was hiding in a corner, very upset, crying. And she said, actually, they were kind of cute, but they stunk. They smelled like sulfur. They smelled really bad. To stop. I just want to stop you there for a minute. And it's another very common thing, especially with the grays, is they, they always stink. They always smell for some weird reason. Um, and she's saying, Mike, Mike wasn't in the room over. Mike was in a different hotel about a block away and he had a flash of light and an experience as well. So it's important to know that Mike is not like close. They smelled really bad. And the kind that would usually abduct her were more like praying mantis, the, the taller aliens, but they didn't have that odor to them. So Lacey is typically abducted. Her events typically involved the praying mantis looking 
aliens. So she already was like, so that's why she felt guilty. She thought it was because of her. But what ended up happening were greys. And she had never really dealt with the greys before, but the greys came and usually came for Alice. Uh, so yeah. it was, they weren't there for Lacey. Lacey was more or less left alone and so, yeah. not taken. Just to so clarify question what's about going. Alice. So question about Alice. Yes. On a scale from Jesse to Mathis on shrooms, like uh, Mathis on shrooms, 100% on scale. <laughs> I don't, at this point, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about her. She is, know? she is going to a UFO conference with people yeah, who are I saying think they're she abducted believes, and she believes she's been abducted. She's full on Mathis. 100%. Yes, I, I, she's a believer for sure. She's definitely a believer. She talks about it casually as if it's actually totally real. Well, because it's been happening. She's to talking her about her how they're at breakfast life. the next day being like, man, last night's alien abduction was crazy, right? Like that's well, no, they were all feeling sick. And then they heard about the blood on the pillow, which was like the first time it kind of came right, but up. She, but even, but even Alice is like, yeah, you know, she's, she's always uh, kidnapped by the praying mantis ones, you know, the tall ones. So Again, those, yeah, I, those I feel guys, they don't stink on like those own grays. Self. Those grays they're stink. All part of, they're all part of the same abduction support group. People who have yeah. had, they're not good experiences. They don't have fun with them, but they all so she's have just them. just extremely familiar with Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 sure, exactly. They've all talked about it with each other. They're all part of the same okay. group. They're all here at this con convention together as Ciro. So they all know each all other. Right. All right, continue. Okay, I I'm going to regress a little bit. When we got back to the hotel from having breakfast with Mike and Gina, I knocked on Jack and Melanie's door to ask Jack if he was ready to go to the conference with Mike and me. Well... Jack decided he wasn't going to the conference, and it was like, what? You, you paid all this money to come out here and, and go shopping? And Jack goes, I'm not going to the conference. I'm going to take the girls out for the day. This news was very weird. I, I thought that was so strange that he did not want to go to the conference, so I spent most of the time with Mike, although I wasn't feeling well, and Lacey wouldn't sit with us. She sat by herself. She pretty much stayed by herself, and I didn't know why until much later. When we found out she really felt guilty about what happened to all of us because she remembered what happened. She shouldn't have felt so guilty. It wasn't her fault. Anyway, and she just completely believes Lacey is what I'm trying to mm, get. Yeah, she, she does. does. 100% she does. She hears Lacey say this and she's like, that's Lacey telling yes, the truth. She truly believes that, yeah. La La she believes that Lacey does in fact feel guilty. And, and because she believes in them and the same mythology as Lacey exactly. As sure, I wouldn't say they, was, they necessarily believe in a mythology. They just believe that they are being abducted by what they think are extraterrestrials. Okay. Yeah, they don't believe in the twelve alien races, government, space opera nonsense. Necessarily, yeah, no, yeah that, at least not that they've ever admitted to. Anyway, they all went out to dinner on Saturday night, and I just went back to the hotel room. I was just too sick to go back to the conference on Saturday night. It wasn't until Sunday morning, when we were all getting ready to leave, that I talked to Jack, and that's when he decided to go to the hotel de Coronado and go to the gift shop. But he didn't step a foot. At, he didn't step foot at the hotel until and bum, bum, bum. Sunday. Sunday. Oh, that's, and this is uh, this is the this the, the last, the very one, right? last uh, yeah. page. Yep. This is Sunday it. when the conference was winding down and everyone was getting ready to leave. We didn't really want to go into the conference. And he never saw a speaker. This was really strange because Jack was excited about coming to San Diego for the conference. He even paid in advance. It was so bizarre. I remember you coming up to me at the conference center and telling me that Jack wasn't coming to the conference and that you were not feeling well. Mike also came up to me and told me he wasn't feeling well. Mike wasn't. His ear was bothering him. Well, what was weird was that he had blood on his pillow. He said it came from his ear, and when I asked him about it, he said, Oh, no, no, no. I, I went to the bathroom and hit my chin on a sink, and that's where the blood came from. But then I asked him, Mike, you said it came from your ear. This went on for years. I would ask Mike to tell me what happened. Same story, like he was programmed. I went to the bathroom. I hit my chin. I would say, Mike, stop thinking. Uh, stop. Think about what you're saying. And he actually had to, like, stop and say, that doesn't make sense. And I would say, hello. I'm telling you, <laughs> he was programmed. Because what? there was no way he said it came from his chin because he didn't have a cut on his chin and his mouth wasn't bleeding. It was clear it came from his ear. That's the important part of that is that there was no cut on his chin the next morning. There was no wound on his face the next morning. He was just saying it. It was literally, it seemed yeah. like he was just saying it. Um, so just important to note. Well, it seems that night Melanie was taken. I was taken. 
Mike had an experience. Lacey heard a man screaming in the hallway that she thought was Mike, and Jack heard the screaming. I don't remember anything. I, I mean, they really did a number on me because I can't remember anything except the flash of light. I think what happened to me could have been uh, one of the worst. I'm positive, probably 98% positive that's where I was implanted. I mean, it makes, Greys are notably not the nicest in their abduction scenarios, so that makes sense if they, you know, didn't have a nice treatment, because Greys don't typically give a shit. Imagine what it would be like if a dog had to, like, serve you food. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, it wouldn't be, like, clean. No. Maybe a dog serving a dog would be fine, but, like. Yeah, but not the other way. <laughs> or how you serve a dog food, honestly. Sure, on the floor. Or how you get a dog to do anything. Yeah. You know? July 10, 1996, this was... Two months after the surgery, I remember getting a weird headache that night. I didn't want to go to sleep. I had a feeling that something would happen. That night, nothing did. But the following night, July 11th, around 11 p.m., I started to get a bad headache, unusual, on the right side of my face behind my temple and eye. I took an aspirin, free painkiller. Okay, an aspirin, free painkiller. Gotcha. I thought it would help the headache and allow me to sleep through the night. I finally went to sleep around 12, 10 a.m. Bill was already asleep. Amber was asleep in front of her TV, and Angelina was watching her TV in her room. Sometime between 12, 15, and 1 a.m., Angelina noticed her TV having trouble with images for a few channels. So, the double images, whoops. So, she turned off her TV and went to sleep. Amber told me that she was asleep until around 2.45 a.m. Bill said that at 1.05 a.m., he awoke as a bright white light was shining into our bedroom through the bathroom and also another light through our bedroom door as it was slightly open. He thought it was time to get up and get ready for work as it was so bright. He sat up in bed, turned on his lamp out of habit, looked at his clock. It was 1.05 a.m. And he thought, oh, God, oh, good, I can go back to sleep. Then he looked at my side of the bed and noticed that the covers were pulled back and I was gone. When he awoke in the morning, he woke. What? <laughs> he, yeah, he just went back to he sleep. Went, <laughs> he apparently went back to what? bed. What? What? Okay. All right. Okay. When he awoke in the morning, he woke me up asking, where'd you go last night? He thought maybe I'd gone downstairs for some reason. However, I, I didn't go anywhere. Yeah, he he just a beam. He did just think maybe she just went downstairs and just immediately went back to sleep. He wasn't stressed or anything, and he wasn't like sitting up waiting to see maybe she had gone to the bathroom or something. It was just one of those, and he just fell back asleep very quickly. I had taken the medication, which makes me sleep very soundly, and almost nothing will wake me. I didn't notice when I awoke that my right ear hurt and it was wet inside. I swabbed it and then kept the Q-tip for Doctor Lear. I, I I later gave him two Q-tips. All day I was very ill. I had an earache in my right ear, a headache, and my stomach was very upset. I think that's when they discovered the implant was gone, and they were pretty pissed off. Whatever they did to me, they really hurt me because I woke up with a really bad earache. The Greys came back for revenge abduction. <laughs> Punched her in the head. <laughs> Get in line. I think what they did was say, you know, this one is going in your ear. So... You cannot get this one out. It was like they were really upset, really ticked off. If people want to have their implants removed, thinking it will stop the abductions because it's removed, well, it won't. And they will put another one in. And I think now maybe they're putting them in places that may be a little hard to get to. In the morning, we noticed that our dog, Snowy, had scratched three large spots into the family room carpeting, which is very unlike him. Angelina's TV has acted up since that time. Uh... Has acted up since that? Okay, mm -hmm. sure. There's been double image uh, one other time since then. Since this incident, I have, since this incident, I've been very tired, and something just doesn't seem right. But I'm not sure what it is. I've also continued to have pain in my right ear. You know, a lot of people claim to be abdu abductees, but my story is such that I, I have the physical evidence. If you look at my story and my history and my brother and my husband, you'll see some of this stuff that he's woken up to, uh, awoken up with too and things that have happened to him. My story is actually quite unique that there is so much physical evidence to go back up the story and so many relatives and friends involved. That is why this book that you're writing is so important because it really, 
I think it's one of the better group ab abduction cases because of the physical evidence. I think, how in the world could this have happened on Coronado Island? I, I mean, the place was crawling with Secret Service. Imagine some alien was about to, like, kidnap some person and then, like, get <laughs> shot in the head by a fucking Secret Service yes. agent in the doorway. Like, put that lady down, sir. I don't think I was surprised, but I was angry. It just wasn't okay to take people without their consent. Mainly me. My anger then went to being just plain curious. Why me? I always read about UFOs, even when I was very young. My mother went to the public library every few weeks, and I always went with her look uh, went with her looking for UFO books. I read any book I could find, but I didn't know why. I just needed to know about the subject for some reason. It wasn't until I was in my 30s I figured out why I was so intrigued about the subject. These experiences have impacted my life tremendously. I know from these experiences that our world is very complex. What we see is only a very small portion of what is really going on. This experience made me think outside of the box, so to speak. I am more open to believing that there is more than just us on many various levels of existence. I am very fortunate that my family is very understanding, but unfortunately, this same process of abduction is also happening to my husband, brother, sister-in-law, parents, and many of my good friends. It's very unsettling to have marks and scars on your body and have no recollection of how you got them. I was shocked and angry when I found that I had an object in my leg once again. I was sh shocked and back to angry. I just wanted the scar gone. <laughs> Under any circumstances, I didn't know why, but just that this scar really made me upset and it made me feel violated. Right after it was removed, I felt really weak and needed to sit and rest for a while. After a short while, I felt just fine until the next time I was abducted, and they noticed their implant was missing. This was approximately two months later. The abductions, two nights in a row, were very abusive. I felt like I had been run over by a truck. I was really sick. Terrible earache and felt generally terrible. Next night was the same. I felt sick in the morning. On the first night when I was abducted, Bill woke up at 1 a.m. as our bedroom was lit up like daylight and I was not in bed. Then he just fell back asleep. In the morning, he asked me where I was during the night and I was feeling really sick and very angry. At that point, we both knew what was happening during the night. Shout out to Bill. Bill Clinton, that is. <laughs> yeah, good job, Bill Clinton. And that's the end of this particular testimony, this particular woman's story and the general uh, event that she encountered at Island, <clears throat> on Coronado Island at the Hotel de Coronado. Now, obviously, you can tell she's talking. She's injecting a lot of her own. Like, they must have been mad. They must have given me more. And there's no evidence that the Greys were mad and like they 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 came back for revenge abduction and all this other stuff. She's just kind of like a believer. Yes. So she's kind of uh, being like, obviously, this is what right. this means. And yeah. you might be like, well, maybe there's something with the implant. You know, maybe something got lodged in her leg. Maybe it's a freak accident. So I will simply leave you. With next week, when we wrap up this saga, we will talk about a totally different person who was involved in this abduction, a man by the name of Jesse, who also, oh. who also not only had something implanted with a scar, with photos, and seeing it removed, but wasn't dealing with the grays, but a tall white instead. It's so weird. That guy didn't smell, and actually, he was as comfortable to be around. That's crazy. <laughs> he was better than the little gray guys. Yeah, great yeah. Guy. yeah I don't I think those he was little better. gray guys. So objectively I better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about next week. We will not be going as deep as we have with this one case, but we will be talking about multiple cases next week, and we'll wrap up the event. Again, I highly suggest you look into this event if it intrigues you. It's a phenomenal case. I want to go stay at this fucking hotel. Is what I want to do. <laughs> I, Even if you don't believe, it's still a phenomenal case in terms of like maybe something weird happened mental health wise and they had a group delusion for some reason. Like, who knows? But that's I, I just think the Coronado group abduction deserves a lot more love out there in the UFO world. And I would love to see um, more people look into it, more research. If there's anything else to learn or what have you, I, I oh, it's so fucking good. It's up. It's one of my favorite favorite events. So on that. Are we good to end, boys? You have any last last thoughts you want to get out, Jesse? No, I I am okay. very curious about where we're going, and I think yeah. that where we've been has been interesting. But I one hundred percent don't. Uh, there's, I have so many questions, and none of it is like yes, of course. Oh well, yeah. I must believe what she's saying. But like, it's interesting. It's certainly an interesting event. 
Yeah. I know. Super, super good evidence. Uh, but I just want to say this. <laughs> Tickets to our live show are available now at ChiluminatiPod.com. So go buy them. And then we will buy one pair of glow-in-the-dark vampire teeth, and you will wear them for Alex's big smile one minute after the beginning of the and show. Then we will all forget. I can't wait. Hashtag Alex's big smile. <laughs> Let me know. No one's going to do that. On Twitter. No one's find doing that. My name is on Twitter. Find me on Twitter <laughs> at Jesse Cox. What? Find me there. See you guys Yeah, thank later. you guys so much. We love you. We'll be over at Patreon for the next mini-sode, which also has aliens involved. So, And, uh, and one that Jesse might actually accept a little bit. Can't wait. See you there at patreon.com slash Illuminati pod. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. What do you think the odds are that this is going to end up in the episode? If you, if you can hear this, if you can hear this, let me know by writing me on Twitter at hashtag Alex's big smile. Don't leave that. I mean, they, maybe they get that one clip out of completely un, with no context. Anyway, me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside, and after a few moments, I hear my wife go, Holy shit, get out here! So I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky.